In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the shape of indifference curves. First, we'll talk about complements and substitutes. Then, we'll talk about special indifference curves and their shapes for the case of perfect complements and perfect substitutes. Finally, we'll talk about the shape of a usual indifference curve. Let's get started by talking about complements and substitutes. Two goods are called complements if they are consumed with one another. So, for example, hammer and nails are complements. On the other hand, substitutes are goods which are exchangeable with one another. So, butter and margarine, for example, are substitutes. Now, there are also perfect complements and perfect substitutes. Perfect complements are goods which must be consumed with one another. For example, left foot and right foot shoes must be consumed together. There would be no sense in buying one without the other. Similarly, perfect substitutes are goods that are completely exchangeable. For example, if you have two different CD brands for blank discs, there would be no reason to buy one over the other. All blank discs are the same. You now have enough information about complements and substitutes to try some questions involving them. So, to start off, try to draw the indifference curves between left and right shoes. So pause here and try to answer the question. To answer this question, consider some arbitrary bundle, say, three left shoes and four right shoes. How would you feel between this bundle and a bundle of three left shoes and five right shoes? or two left shoes and seven right shoes. Obviously, you don't care how many more right shoes you have as long as there's a left shoe to match it. So between a bundle of three left and four right and three left and seven right, you don't care. But two left and seven right is less preferred than the previous two bundles. So, thinking about this logic, what you get is indifference curves of this form. Around here, at two two, I'm just as happy around here at 210 because all I care about is having pairs of shoes, not how many more right shoes or how many total shoes I have. So for each pair of shoes, there is one indifference curve. Mm -hmm. Now let's try to answer a related question. Here we have a standard budget line between right shoes and left shoes. Which bundle is chosen? So pause there and try to answer the question. The key to answering this question is to remember that we only care about pairs of shoes. So let's see what kind of pairs are available to us. We could get one pair, two pairs, three pairs, but we cannot get four pairs. It's easier to see how to answer this question if we look at it on a grid. So here I put a grid in, and you can see clearly that four pairs is not available, but three pairs is. There are other bundles that we can acquire, which still give us three and three. These bundles, which are just as preferred as three, three, are in the red region right here. However, since we are talking about right shoes and left shoes, not all the points in this region make sense. For example, this point right here, right around 3.5, 3.5, makes no sense because you cannot have half a right shoe and half a left shoe. So, the possible chosen bundles are simply 3.3, three, 3, 4, which does make sense, and 4, 3, which also makes sense. Let's now ask one final question related to right shoes and left shoes. So suppose I'm going out and I want to buy a pair of shoes. Does it matter how much one half of a pair of shoes is priced as long as the entire pair sells for $15? So pause here and try to answer the question. Given our discussion of the previous questions, the answer to this should be pretty obvious. And the answer is no, it does not matter because again, for perfect complements, they must be bought together. So all we care about is the price of both perfect complements. 
All we care about is the price of the pair of shoes as a whole, not the separate prices. So if the left shoes cost fourteen ninety nine and the right shoes cost one penny, it is no different than if the left shoes cost eight dollars and the right shoes cost seven dollars. We don't care. All we care about is the price of the pair of shoes. By this point, I'm sure you're quite bored about talking about shoes. So let's transfer to a much more riveting topic: blank CDs. So consider verbatim and Memorex brand blank CDs. Draw the indifference curves between these two. So pause here and try to draw these indifference curves. To answer this question, it's again a good idea to consider arbitrary bundles. So consider four verbatim and three Memorex. How do you feel between this bundle and zero verbatim and seven Memorex, or two verbatim and five Memorex? Well, if you're a normal person, you really don't care, because verbatim and Memorex brand blank CDs are perfect substitutes. You don't care which one you have because they are both virtually identical. Going along with this idea, we see that the indifference curves are the set of all bundles, such that the coordinates of the bundles add up to a certain number. So, in other words, we're going to get lines as indifference curves that look like this. The key thing to notice about these indifference curves is that since these goods are perfect substitutes. We are willing to give up only one unit of one good for one unit of another. Let's try another perfect substitutes question. So here we have a budget line for Memorex and Verbatim. Which bundle is chosen? So pause here and try to answer the question. To answer this question, we need to consider only which bundle gives us the most total quantity of CDs. We don't care about having Memorex versus Verbatim. We only care about having the most blank discs. Intuitively, you would think that on this line, it's going to have to be one of the intercepts. Now, if we put a grid on, it's going to be easier to see that that intuition is correct. So here we have the grid, and you can see that, for example, one eight is not available, which would have given us nine discs, but zero nine is. Another way of seeing that zero nine is a chosen bundle is by drawing the indifference curves, and you can see that the furthest out indifference curve, the one which corresponds to the greatest utility, is the one that touches zero nine. In other words, all we're going to get is nine Memorex CDs. Try to answer now a trickier but similar question. Here we have another budget line between Memorex and Verbatim blank CDs. Which bundle is chosen? Pause here and try to answer the question. To answer this question, again, just visualize the indifference curve. Notice that the budget line has slope negative one. What this means is that the budget line is sitting on top of an indifference curve. So. The consumer could choose any bundle along the budget line, and any of these bundles could be a utility maximizing bundle. So instead of having a chosen bundle, he has a set of bundles from which he could choose any one and be equally happy. Now let's shift from our discussion of perfect complements and perfect substitutes and talk about normal indifference curves. So the standard shape of a normal indifference curve is convex to the origin. Now convexity has a very intricate mathematical meaning, but essentially you can consider it as bulging towards the origin. So this is easier to see when we look at a picture. Right here we have a standard indifference curve, convex or bulging towards the origin. To understand the meaning of convexity. Let's consider moving along the indifference curve and see what that means. So suppose we start right here at this black point and move over to the red point. So to get this increase in oranges, we have to give up quite a few apples 
to stay on the same indifference curve, and we're fine with that. We're fine with giving up a lot of apples for some oranges. Now, let's consider moving from the red dot to the blue bundle, like this. Now, to get this many oranges, we are much less willing to give up apples. Then, in moving from the blue to the green bundle, we are scarcely willing to give up any apples at all, even for a large increase in oranges. So essentially, what convexity gives us is the common sense intuition that as you would get more oranges, you would be less willing to give up additional apples for additional oranges. Before ending this lesson, I'd like to comment on one final thing. In all the examples of complements and substitutes that we've been talking about in this lesson, so far we've only been talking about perfect substitutes and perfect complements. However, in most cases, complements and substitutes are not perfect. They are partial. For example, you can consider bread and butter. Now, these are certainly complements because they go together. We eat bread with butter. However, they are not exclusive to each other. They can be used for other things. You can make a peanut butter sandwich, or you can put butter on your mashed potato. Similarly, Coke and Pepsi are substitutes. However, people have slight preferences towards the taste of one or the other, so they are not perfect substitutes. Because they are not completely and absolutely exchangeable. Because bread and butter and Coke and Pepsi are not perfect complements and perfect substitutes, their indifference curves are not going to be identical to the ones that we went over in the questions. Instead, they are going to be in between the indifference curves of the perfect complements and the perfect substitutes and the ideal, normal indifference curve. So, for example, for bread and butter, which are complements, we might get an indifference curve that looks kind of like this. For Coke and Pepsi, we might get indifference curves that look kind of like this. Alright, so that's going to be all for this time. And for next time, you should read section 2.2, do exercises 1 through 3, true and false questions 1 and 4 through 6, and if you're mathematically inclined and want a bit of a challenge, try true and false questions 2 to 3. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and I'll see you next time.